Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. Understanding Sin and Its Causes is the fourth assistance group in the Education and Love series. In this presentation, titled Awakening to Sin, Jesus presents the process of awakening to sin, contrasts morality and ethics, discusses moral direction and condition, gives examples of moral flaws, describes the story of sin playing out in my personal life, and explains the personal requirements and qualities I must develop in order to awaken to sin. Recorded on the 23rd of February 2019 from 1.45pm in Nooseville, Queensland, Australia. Tomorrow I'll be a bit, try to be a bit more on time. Although, actually, I'm not giving you any talks tomorrow, so. No, I've decided to go on strike. <laughs> <laughs> Need more pay. <laughs> uh, okay. So the topic of this conversation is awakening to sin. How many of you have read the Paget messages? Yep, quite a number. You'll notice in the Paget messages there's one very important message that talks about how you can't actually receive God's love until you awaken to sin. And most people don't really understand what that means, right? So they think that they can just sort of continue sinning and still receive God's love. But you need to awaken in order to receive. And for most of us, what we try to do is suppress awakening to sin we try to stay away from awakening to sin and then we also try at the same time to receive some love and isn't that very similar to what we do in our day-to-day -day life with people we often do not awaken to the real relationship and yet we still want love from them we might be unkind to them or they might be unkind to us we're willing to put up with all of that as long as they give us a bit of love sometimes right now god's not like that of course god have some fairly important laws that govern the flow of love. And one of them is that we need to decide to have an awakening to sin in order to receive God's love. So this discussion is going to be a very important discussion to the process of receiving God's love. It's very important to understand awakening to sin must occur before you can do anything about sin. And so that's why we need to have this discussion with you. So just a few reminders first. Remember, we had the definition of sin. So by now you should be starting to get used to that. There's the sins of commission, which is will or desire in harmony with God's principles or God's love, and sins of omission, the absence of will or desire in harmony with God's principles or God's love. So... Did I say harmony or disharmony yeah. the first time? Yeah. Oh, I, said, I should have said disharmony, shouldn't I? <laughs> but yes, so you can see that there's these two types of sins, basically, and both of them involve our condition, which is our current state, and our desires, which is our aspired to future state. So that's what sin involves. We know the causes and effects, so we'll just skip over that for a moment. We've, we've talked about that before. What we want to do is look at the process of awakening to sin. We're going to try to be as succinct as possible about this process. We're going to look at two factors regarding the process. Firstly, there's the process itself, in other words, what we're going to have to do to really fully awaken to our sin. And then there's, you could say, qualities or attributes we're going to need to develop in ourselves to actually awaken to sin requirements of us if you like of what we need to awaken to sin and in between the, those two discussions that we're going to have with you in this presentation we're going to slot in something called morality and it's morality that most of us have a bit of a problem with right so we need to have a discussion and introduce a proper discussion about morality 
So the basic structure of our presentation is a discussion about awakening to sin, a discussion about morality, and then a discussion about the requirements of what qualities we're going to need to awaken to sin. So let's get started. Awakening to sin is recognizing and accepting emotionally that I have a desire to sin. <laughs> now, I have to accept it, recognize it, and accept it emotionally. Now, that's the thing that everyone finds the hardest to do. It's one thing to accept it intellectually, right? To go, yes, I know I'm a sinner. Yes, logically, based on what I see in my life and what I see happening around me, I must be sinning logically. Well, it's one thing to see it logically, quite another to actually feel it emotionally. And that's where we see most people come unstuck when it comes to awakening to sin. While they will give verbal assent to the fact that they sin, emotionally, it's almost complete denial about sin. Now, the key is to transist in this awakening phase to go from this verbal intellectual acknowledgement that sin exists within me to a state where you really feel that it is within you. Right? And that is the difficulty. That's why very few people awaken to sin on earth, even though they might acknowledge it intellectually. Right? So this is something for us to bear in mind. It's an emotional process of awakening. It's not an intellectual one. Right? And this is the tricky part to it. It's going to involve some feelings. It's got to, in fact, involve some feelings before you can actually experience an awakening. So the first emotional acknowledgement we need to have is that I have a sinful will and desire. Right? That is, I have a will to either be in disharmony with God's laws or a will to avoid being in harmony with God's laws. One of the two. And that I have that, that's in me, coming to accept that emotionally is the important thing. Now, I see many of you have a temptation to accept it intellectually when you're around people who also accept it. But when you're actually in your day-to-day -day actual life, you barely consider it. That's an indication that when you're influenced by people who are positive, you will accept it. But when you're influenced by people who are not positive about the aspect of sin, in other words, not recognizing sin, you don't accept it. So have you really accepted it? A person who accepts it emotionally accepts it whether they are in private or in public, do they not? Yeah. So that's a good idea. It's a good way that we can measure. Have I really accepted it or not? If I'm still acting the same way with people normally, and then with people who accept some level of God's truth, I act differently, then that's an indication I have yet to accept it emotionally. And it's the emotional acceptance of it that is the process of awakening. So we need to bear that in mind. So I also need to emotionally accept that my sinful will and desire create sinful actions, resulting in pain and suffering to myself, others, and the environment. In other words, it's about coming to accept emotionally that a lot of the pain and suffering that I am experiencing in my life and the pain and suffering that I help create in my environment and in, in others is the result of the fact that I have a sinful will and desire. And it's about accepting that also emotionally. So it's one thing to go, yes, I can see I do that. Quite another to actually feel sincerely that you do do that. Right? And we need to start seeing this emotional acceptance is very, very different than just these words that come out of our mouth. Emotionally accepting that my sinful will and desire are flaws. They're not a part of my nature. They're not a part of the way God created me. 
They're not there because my family did whatever they did in my childhood. They're not there because I had some bad experiences. They are flaws that exist in me because I'm choosing to keep them in there and not correct them. That's why they're there. It's an emotional acceptance of that fact. Now, again, it's one thing to intellectually accept that, isn't it? Quite another to go emotionally that you actually start seeing that, ah, these flaws must be corrected for the sake of myself, others, and the environment. Otherwise, I'm not going to change. Right? What I notice about sin is most of the time what we're trying to do is we're trying to hold on to the illusion that we're not sinning while we're sinning. And then on top of that, we refuse to acknowledge that it has any effect on anybody else, even upon ourselves, most of the time. And this is why we reach for painkillers and why we reach for substances and why we reach for alcohol and drugs and why we want sex for some emotional stimulant to feel good about ourselves or whatever it is. It's because we're avoiding the truth that actually all of these things that are our sins harm ourselves and others. See, if you really felt that they harmed you, would you do them? No, you would not do them. So the fact that we still do them means we don't really emotionally believe that they harm us. It makes sense, doesn't it? And to awaken to sin, we have to emotionally accept they harm us. So we haven't, yet emotion, we haven't yet awakened if we feel that we can still sin with impunity, even though we might intellectually acknowledge that's probably not true, but emotionally we're still doing it. It means that we have yet to emotionally accept the truth about our sin and therefore yet to awaken. Also, emotionally accept that my sinful actions cannot be fully corrected without correcting my will or desire. This is a very tricky one for most of us, you know, because what we finish up doing is we finish up going when we start recognising our sin. We finish up going, hmm, I can see my sin's not a good thing, right? Intellectually, I can see it's causing my damage and, you know, I've heard enough truth about it now and I can see it playing out in my life. And so what do I do with that? I go, well, maybe all I need to do is just make a long list of all the things that I do wrong and just stop doing them, right? And if I focus on that enough, you know, the whole, the whole like 21 days practice thing, then it will become perfect type of thing. You know how that theory that people have that, you know, if you practice something consistently for 21 days, after 21 days it should be completely different. That's the theory, anyway. doesn't work very well, of course, but that's the theory. That does not acknowledge this emotionally, does it? Emotionally, we're saying here, we can't correct the sin without correcting the will or desire that's in disharmony or the lack of will or desire that's in harmony. We have to correct that. It's not it's just a simple matter of changing our mind and changing our decision, is it? Because our decisions are driven by the feelings that are in us, the condition that's in us, and unless our condition changes, how can what we do change? We can struggle against it, you know, and this is why you hear in a lot of religious circles, you hear this whole thing of, I'm struggling with my sin, I'm putting up a good fight, you know, I'm fighting the, there's a scripture in the Bible that actually says, fight the fine fight. I'm proposing that if you have to fight your sin, the will and desire has not been corrected. And without correcting the will and desire, nothing's going to change. And I have to emotionally accept that my sinful actions are the result of the will and desire in disharmony or the lack of will of desire and desire in harmony. If I'm going to emotionally accept that, I've got to give up this whole concept of fighting of intellectually changing, of doing different and therefore being different. I've got to stop all that. That's all just crap, right? It's rubbish. We need to throw away. 
And we need to come to understand that to awaken to sin, I must first awaken to the fact that unless my will and desire change, I will continue to sin. Makes sense, doesn't it? And surely it's going to be easier to change your will and desire rather than fighting your will and desire every single day for the rest of your existence in order to stop sinning. See, that just causes exhaustion. That's what that does. And many of you have experienced that in the last 10 years where you've gone, yeah, no, I can see I do that wrong and I see I do that wrong and I see I do that wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm just not going to do that thing wrong anymore. (laughs) Now, while you're conscious of it, what happens? You manage it for a short period of time, right? Just for a short period usually. But get yourself in a situation that's confronting and what do you do? Bang, you're back to original state, right? And the reason why we do that is because we're not emotionally recognising that I have to change my will and desire it. I'm trying to do different without realising that I've got to feel different before I'm going to do different. Right? So I'll say that again. I've got to feel different before I will do different. So something's got to change with regard to my feelings, with regard to my will and desire. Otherwise, nothing is going to change in what I, how I act. Right? Now, awakening of sin involves seeing that emotionally. In other words, it involves giving up this intellectual fight with your sin. Right? It involves giving it up, stopping it rather than continuing it. Right? So you can easily tell someone who's awakened to sin, they no longer try to modify their sin through their force of action or their intellect. They awaken to sin. The other people who just try to fight, try to fight, try to resist, try to resist their sinful desires, those people never are successful until they have this emotional awakening, never successful in removing sin. Go ahead and tell me what to do. (laughs) Well, yes, if that was true. (laughs) Okay. I feel an imperative to, this is in the awakening of sin, this is emotionally accepting that I feel an imperative to and take action to correct my sinful will and desires and actions. And I compensate and make reparation for the damaging results of my sin. So in other words, emotionally, I've got to this stage now if I'm waking in sin, emotionally I'm going, right, I realise that I sin, I feel it emotionally, and because of that, because it's an emotional feeling, I now have an imperative that develops within me, desires that develop within me that go, oh, I need to do something about this. I need to stop doing what I'm doing. I need to take some different actions here and I need to work through this problem of my will and desire. Not only do I need to do that, but I also need to correct my will and desire and I need to repair the damage of my sin, what I did wrong. I need to start fixing it up. Right? You could liken it to building a bridge. You know, quite often I've said to Mary in our relationship, I said, Darling, you keep wanting to tear down the bridge between us in our relationship, right? When are you going to stop tearing it down and build the bridge? The person who has an awakening to sin builds things rather than destroying things. They build relationships rather than destroying them. They take positive actions to repair damage. Now, it does not mean that other people won't resist that action because they will. You know, if you've got a family that says love is doing this and you now know that that doing that is a sin and you stop doing that thing, what are they going to do? They're going to complain. They're going to think you're sinning now. Before they thought you weren't sinning and now they think you're a bit of a bastard, you're sinning now, right? That's what they're going to feel. 
But it's not true from God's perspective. You're fixing your sin. So this is, of course, driven by God's truth, not by what other people think you should be doing, which are often very much diametrically opposed. So we've got to get to that stage emotionally as well. If we just go back to that section, the process of awakening to sin involves an emotional process of change. And it involves emotionally accepting every one of those things we listed. And it involves giving up the intellectual and control-based fight against your sin. Now, for most people, that's scary for a number of reasons. See, a lot of people, particularly, again, people with religious backgrounds, have a tendency to believe that if you give up your fight against sin, you're just going to go nuts with sin. Isn't that true? A lot of people feel that, that you're just going to go nuts sinning because there's no restriction anymore. You're not putting any restriction on yourself anymore. That's not what we're recommending, of course. What we're recommending is that you give up the fight against your sin and instead develop the action of looking at your desires and intentions and will. So in other words, changing your focus away from trying to change your actions, which are really just the effects of your sin, and instead fix the cause of your sin which is your will and desire, exercise in disharmony with love, or your lack of will and desire in harmony with love. They are the things that need to be fixed. There's one other thing I'd like to say about this awakening to sin, and that is it's much easier to identify a will or desire exercised in disharmony with love than it is to identify a lack of a will or desire in harmony with love. So in other words, correcting sins of omission are often much more difficult than correcting sins of commission. Sins of commission are usually easily identified and therefore easy to resolve. Sins of omission are difficult because the concept that exists within you is you're doing the right thing by avoiding situations. And then it's hard to know which situations you should get involved in and which situations you shouldn't, right? So it's a much harder process to correct sins of omission than it is to correct sins of commission. And so to awaken to sin, we need to realise these truths, but we need to realise them emotionally in our hearts. It's not a head thing. It's not an intellectual thing. And it's not going to be a force of will that changes you here. Now, in particular, men like it being a force of intellectual will, right? And so we've got to be careful about using our intellect to change what only can be changed emotionally. Using your intellect, all it's going to do is tire you out. It's going to exhaust you, right? So you've got to give up that. The sooner you give up that, the better. You've got to go to the emotions. You've got to go to changing, emotionally changing, firstly emotionally accepting these things, and then wanting to emotionally change these things. It's the only way forward. Now, I remember when I made that transition in my own life. I was around 33. And I started to, instead of trying to do things intellectually, which was my whole life before then, I used to make lists. I think I've explained to you in previous uh, uh, videos, you would see, that I used to make lists the night before I go to bed of what I was going to do the next day and how I was going to fix everything up the next day, <laughs> which often didn't happen, of course. right? And I used to make these lists and I used to religiously almost follow them 
in order to live my life. Now, I had a very structured and ordered life, but it didn't stop me from sinning. The only time I stopped sinning and therefore felt the results of the improvement, feeling-wise and also physically, was when I started to emotionally accept my sin. When I started to emotionally see these particular points we're raising with you now and actually address them, that's the only time I really started to change. And you're going to find the same yourself. This applies to everybody. You have to go through this emotional stage to awaken to sin. Make sense? Yep. All right, well, let's move on to this issue of morality. There's a lot of philosophy about morality today. Have you noticed that? It's like, is it really wrong? Is that really that bad? Is it, you know, isn't that just a personal opinion? Don't worry about this thing called God. God doesn't exist. It's just what feels good to you is what you should do. You know, there's a lot of very grey areas when it comes to human morality. So when we're talking about morality, what are we really talking about? Well, you notice that all the definitions of sin all include some kind of reference to God's nature or character or some reference to God. So, you know, when we played it in creation to sin, how we listed those, you know, the word sin, corruption, depravity, falling short of the glory of God and all those kind of statements we made. You can see there's all these references to law and God and God's principles all in the word. It's sort of like the word encourages that concept, conceptual thinking. In other words, the word sin encourages the idea that God has moral truths or basically that God has definitions of what is right and what is wrong. And that is true. God does. You know that when you connect to your conscience because you ask God, you know, is this right or wrong? He goes, <laughs> pretty definite about whether it's right or whether it's wrong. Anybody who's connected to their conscience will feel that. So it's true that God has a definition of what is right and wrong. And what we're looking at here is God's definition of morality. What God says is right or wrong. What's the difference between that and ethics? Well, ethics is the application of the golden rule, which is quoted in the Bible of me saying, treat others in the manner that you would like to be treated. Basically, that's the principle. But ethics got some fatal flaws, you know, because if you want to be sexually projected at, and I'm happy to sexually project at you, now we're in agreement with each other and we meet the rule of ethics, do we not? It says treat others in the manner that you would like to be treated. Well, if I like to be treated by having sexual things coming at me from other people, then I go and do that to other people. Now, is that going to work with morality? No, but it does work with ethics, sort of, doesn't it, if you think about it. So the fatal flaw is that many people want to be treated in the manner they treat others even when the manner they treat others is wrong from God's perspective and therefore a sin. This is a problem we have in society, isn't it? Society wants us to act a certain way. But what I've noticed is this. If I give people the feeling that they're a great person, I can get almost anybody to do anything for me. Right? But I don't do that. And so hardly anybody does anything for me, <laughs> right? It's very interesting. But if I projected the feeling, they would. So they want the feeling and they won't even do anything without it, right? We notice it a lot when we get new volunteers to help us like with video production and stuff like that. As long as I give them a good feeling that they're doing a great job, They'll do the job. But all I've got to do is not give them that feeling. They might have still done a good job. But if I neglect to give them the feeling for that day, they're all upset. Right? They think they've done something wrong. 
And I keep saying to them, I'll tell you when you've done something wrong. <laughs> Makes no difference. Eventually they can't handle it. Eventually most people don't do it because they just can't handle not getting this feeling of approval while they're doing something. Right? That's a person wanting to be treated in the manner that they treat others but actually involved in a sin while they do it from God's perspective. And so morality prevents us from doing that, prevents us from treating people in the manner they want to be treated and begins us treating people in the manner God says they should be treated, which is very, very different than how often they want to be treated. This is where many of you are flawed with regard to sin. You do treat people in the manner they want to be treated without considering whether the manner they want to be treated is a sin from God's perspective. And because the person doesn't complain about it, you think you're doing good. But from God's perspective, you're sinning. So this is something to consider. So morality is acting in harmony with God's moral laws, which includes thinking, feeling and acting in a manner that is harmonious with God's moral laws, even if such thinking, feelings, emotions and actions are not how others would like to be treated. Mm. So you know a truth. You know that they don't want to hear that truth. You know that you're going to get attacked if you share that truth. But out of love for them, you would still share the truth, even though you know you're going to get attacked. That's what a person with morality would do. Interesting, hey? How many times do you find yourself doing that? For most people, we go, I'm just going to get hammered. I'm not saying anything, right? We even do that in our marriages, let alone our, <laughs> with our friends and our neighbours and people who are just acquaintances or people we just meet for the first time. It's really interesting, though, because I do that with you and yet you still come to the presentations and stuff. And yet in your day-to-day -day life, you don't do it, thinking that everyone's going to reject you. It's funny how we don't trust God's laws, eh? We think we're going to get a bad result. So that's where our faith is. Our faith is saying, if you tell the truth, it's not going to work out good for you. And so we don't tell the truth. But a moral person goes, even if it's not going to work out good for me, I'm still going to have to tell the truth. Don't you think there's a lot of times I'd like to not say anything to you? A lot of times I know I'm going to get hammered. Like, the last group, we removed like 20 or 30 people. Most of those people hammered me. I knew I was going to get hammered by some of them. But I had to do it. It was an issue of love. It was an issue of morals. It had to be done. Right? That's what a person with morals does. So, ethical behaviour may result in a person sinning, but morality makes sinning impossible. Can you see why? Ethical behaviour says, I'll give you what I would like you to give me. Moral behaviour says, I'll give you what I know God says I should be giving you. Which is, by the way, much more loving than the other because the other is just a codependent barter when you think about it. So... The conscience mechanism is God's way of sharing God's morality. That's how we know what is right and what is wrong. That's also how we know how to act morally. Okay. So we'd just like to talk for a moment about what people do with morality. Most people stop listening to divine truth when they receive some direct personal truth about their moral condition. Of all the people who have ever sent me breakup letters, <laughs> it is a very common thing, by the way. 
Every single one of them has done so after I have shared a personal moral truth with them. Only them. Before then, I was the apple of their eye, as the <laughs> saying goes. Right? But as soon as a personal moral truth was shared, every single person who sent me a breakup letter has always had a personal moral truth before it that has triggered their se a series of behaviour after that. That shows us how much we don't want to hear about our personal morality. And like I said, a lot of us have a lot of shame att attached to it, you know. We're ashamed that something's pointed out or we don't even want to believe that that thing is possible about us. And so what we do is we get angry with the person who shared it. Even if we asked for that in the first place, you know that I rarely, if ever, share anything with anybody unless they ask, right? The only time I don't is if they're in my private space at home or something. But generally, I don't share anything unless a person asks, unless a person wants to know. And yet, I get attacked every single time, generally. Like, and when I say every single time, there's some people sitting in this audience who haven't attacked me for sharing moral truth with them. And to be honest with you guys, those people who've done that, you're very enjoyable people to be around because I know that oh, I don't have to go, oh, here we go, I've got to share this truth and here we go, see what happens now, <laughs> you know what I mean? Not going to be friends anymore after this. I'll get the breakup letter again. <laughs> right? It's beautiful when you can share truth with people without there being a impediment of their reaction. Now, surely you know that even in your relationships. You know, like, it's great when you can be truthful and honest, but most of us are scared of doing that even in our own relationships because we know for most people it's a sensitive issue and they're probably going to go and get angry about the issue, right? That's the trouble. We've got to give up this uh, thing that we do with regard to morals. We need to want morals. They reject the truth and become angry and resentful. Not, not a good thing, right? So most listeners of Divine Truth are focused on emotion without any clear focus on developing moral direction and condition. Oh, yes, I processed this lately and I processed that and I processed it. And Mary and I go, well, how are you still treating that person? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're still treating that person very badly. So you might have processed a whole heap of things, but the reality is, has there been any real will, desire, change? No, because you're still treating people the same way. It's when you treat people differently, automatically, that there's been an actual change. That is an indication that we've actually heard divine truth. So a person who's moral has a steady growth in understanding God's moral position on anything. It begins to awaken to their own sin and they desire the removal of addiction. They want to get rid of their addictions, not don't tell me about another addiction. They want to actually identify and remove their addictions. If we don't yet want to see our addictions and anybody who points out our addictions gets a little salvo, you know, like a... <laughs> you know, I used to know this young guy years and years ago, he had this wonderful way of, you know how you, when you throw a knife at a, at a wall and it goes, <laughs> you know, that sound, he used to go like this, <laughs> <laughs> whenever he felt somebody was stabbing him in the back, right? <laughs> and this is the trouble is that we see people who, who basically are confronting our addiction as somebody stabbing us in the back. But they're not. They're trying to help us usually, right? But no, we would like to see it differently. A person who's moral does not live in a facade about their own condition, does not try to make things look pretty on the surface. Some of you are really bad with this. You're really addicted to making things look pretty. Not good for you. Not good for awakening to sin. You know, awakening to sin is about raw truth, right? Not, oh, pretty facade, everything's nice, everything's great. It's not like that at all. It doesn't mean you have to be like open about, oh, everything's horrible all the time, does it? 
It's about being truthful about what you actually have processed and what you haven't. Right? Without that, you can't make any change. The person who's moral is able to consistently feel and experience and release emotions relating to their sin, not relating to other people's sin. Yeah. What is most of our emotional processing, really? It's really just tantruming about other people's sin. They didn't give me what I wanted. They didn't do this for me. They didn't do that for me. And sometimes it's tantruming about the other people not sinning. (laughs) They didn't do this thing that I really want, even though God wants them to do exactly that. And this is how we are. We are quite selfishly focused and frequently when we process emotion, it's not actually processing emotion, not in the way we've defined it. It's actually just having a tantrum, just like a child does. You know? <laughs> you know, some of us cry with that and some of us might get angry with that, but at the end of the day, have we done any will-based, desire-based change? No, because the very next day, what are we hoping for from the person? exactly the same thing as we wanted the previous day, right? Which is an indication that there has been no awakening. The person who awakens doesn't want that anymore. Yeah. So we can go through many examples of moral flaws, right? You've got them in your notes. I'm not going to go through them all. Now, in one of the outlines, I think it's a couple of days' time, pain and suffering outline, I think there's pages of them, right? (laughs) Or is it reparation and correction? I can't remember which one it's in, but there's pages of stuff there. You can analyse yourself and see what's going on for you using those as a reference. You're intelligent people, self-responsible. I don't need to go through them with you, right? But we do need to see that some of the things we don't think are moral flaws are moral flaws. So... Pretty things, desire to be childish tantrums. Two of them I've already discussed. Desire for sex, regardless of morality. Finances, big issue, finances, big issue. Man, Western society, we're so anal about money. (laughs) Yeah, anal about money. Like, money is more important to us than almost any other thing. Like, Even people love each other, they say. You put them in a divorce court and it's all about the money. (laughs) They used to love each other. Why is it all about the money? Right? It's because we have some very serious injuries about money. Very serious moral flaws. Poor relationship with truth. I mentioned that earlier, right? This whole thing that we do of like, we're opportunity to share truth with somebody, we don't take it. We withhold it. Not good. Raving on about love and then ignoring truth as if we really know what love is, right? If we ignore truth. If we ignore truth, we don't know what love is. Not yet, anyway. So there's a lot of things to look at there. Let's look at this little story. Now, again, you've got this story in your notes, so I'm not going to labour the points with this story because I, I want to focus a bit more on the results of the story than the story itself, right? So let's look at the story. First thing is, sin entered my soul the moment I was conceived. The reason why is quite simple. When I'm conceived, I've not had previous experiences, so I have a completely open soul that absorbs feelings and emotions from its surroundings, which includes its parents. So whatever sins the parents have are emotionally absorbed by me. They are concepts, beliefs that I absorb. Now, once I absorb them, they're in me, right? There's not much I can do about that. I was intellectually not developed. I couldn't prevent the absorption. The only people who could have prevented the absorption is my parents. And that's their sin, that they didn't even try to do that, right? That's their sin. But because of this absorption, the way I feel, think and act is largely directed by the sin that's in me now. 
Saul asked the question about, you know, influences. Remember, we talked about influences and motivations in the previous question and answer session. And, you know, this gets back to that, doesn't it? It's saying, my motivations are now in me. Now, they might have come from all sorts of sources, but they're now in me. Only I can act upon them or choose not to. And only I can remove them or choose not to. No one else can do those things for me. Now they're in me. So while we've had this terrible impediment from the beginning of our life with conce after conception, which is the result of our parents not wanting to release their sin, right? at the end of the day, the sin is now in me and now I've got choices to make. I can choose to act upon it or not. So what do I do? The sin of my forefathers taints my perception of the world. Remember Mary had the glasses on this morning. The glasses are hand-me-downs. You get that? Uh, my parents' glasses handed down to me. So however my parents see the world, perceive everything, is how I now see the world, perceive everything. Now this usually happens until I'm seven or eight or nine years of age. And then I start the process of rebellion. But unfortunately, the sin is in me. Even if I rebel against the way my parents act upon it, I'm likely still going to sin because I'm going to still act upon the sin that's inside of me rather than acting in a pure way. I'm going to do what's wrong even though I think it's right. That's the problem, right? Then what do I do? Well, once I believe a sin is right, <laughs> I'm going to do it, aren't I? If I believe something's right, I'm, I'm going to live my life like that. I'm going to do it. So if I believe that it's right to calm a person down when they're feeling afraid, because that's what I was taught was right, and that's what I want from people, if I believe that's right, can you see that every time someone's afraid, I'm going to calm them down? And I'm probably just going to do that automatically, right? Just going to, oh, she's afraid. Now, if I was taught that by my mother, but not my father, then I'll do it with women, but probably not with men. But my perception of what is right and wrong from God's perspective has been distorted. I don't really know what's right and wrong. I'm just going by the hand-me-downs, the glasses that my parents have handed down to me as my reality. So I'm living in a fantasy, but I think it's reality. I think it's the way that everybody sees the world, but it's not. Now, some things society believes is true, so everybody thinks the same way. But other things, only my family thought was true, or only my family tree thought was true, and so I think the way they think. And this is how we get concepts like, my family's better than your family. Hmm. That's how nations come to be, in fact. Right in the early days, there were no nations. But what happened was families started to squabble with each other and they all decided eventually that the squabbles were too much trouble and so they separated from each other. And families went some way and other families went other way and each family had two specific genetic traits and some of them, even right at that beginning time, created their own forms of speech, languages, in order to create separation from the other families. Interesting, huh? Yeah, when you talk to the spirits who observe that, it's quite fascinating. Yeah. You imagine, right at the beginning, everyone spoke the same language, whatever that was. Only a mon and a man really can tell you what that was. And then after a short period of time, there were already different languages. In the Bible, they call that the Tower of Babel. <laughs> mm. The time when God confused the languages of the people. That's what it says. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> the things God is meant to have done. Why would God confuse the languages when confusing languages creates division? Right? 
as Mary knows, I get very frustrated with language. <laughs> in the spirit world, once you're in this in the celestial spheres, there's really, you know, everything's telepathic, of course, so, you know, there's no real need for language. But below the celestial heavens, there is language still. But by the time you reach the sixth sphere, it's very rare for anybody to speak a different language, you know, like very rare situation because it creates separation. Yeah, but we're lovely. We want separation, don't we? Yeah. So we perpetuate the sin. So I often know my sins are wrong, but I don't care about the full consequences. So I want, I want what my sin gives me. So I do it. That's what I want. The final outcome is death. But here I'm not talking about physical death just physical death. Getting old and dying is all about sin, of course. But I'm talking about the death of your soul. The soul gets squished into this, you know, like there's people who arrive in the spirit world. You can't even recognize them as a person hardly. They're so detuned from every desire, from every emotion. All they want is sin, sin, sin. And they, their whole body is struggling even to stay together. It's like they have leprosy. They have flesh falling off of them, literally. Where do you think all these things about zombies and stuff came from? It came from places in the spirit world where there's people like that. Right? It's terrible. All because of this incessant desire to sin. Right? And you think of all those things as a fantasy, but, you know, Honestly, there's not too many people who arrive, say, in the first, top of the first or early second sphere of the spirit world who want to visit the hills <laughs> because it's hard to go there if you don't love people. It's hard to go there because there's, people are just in so much suffering because of the sin they created on earth. Yep. It's a terribly damaging thing. Damage your physical body, your spirit body, your moral condition, the way in which you desire things, the way in which you act the kinds of things you look for. A lot of people pass this earth and they are in such a frenzy they don't even know they've died. Don't even know they've passed. They live like that for years, some hundreds of years. I've seen some thousands of years like that, literally not even knowing that they've died. They're still living as if they're living here. Yeah. You know, you sometimes see them in places like that used to be gold fields and mining camps and everything, you know. You go there and they're still there. There's some of the spirits from 300 years ago. They're still mining the land as if they're fine and gold, still living their life, not even conscious they've died. You can talk to them, but it's hard to talk to them because they don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> they're so incessant about getting the gold, you know. What, what can you do? Until they have an awakening to sin. Not much you can do. This is why the awakening is so important. So how does this play out? Well, you guys have seen examples of this. Like, What we find generally happens is this. Most people come to us, right, and eventually they want some feedback. You know, they want some feedback about you know, their life or their personal circumstances or situation. And... You know, of course, because we love them, we, you know, anybody who asks, we try to help them if we can. If we have the time to do that and we, and we can, we try to do that. So we do. We try to give some feedback. In the last group, we did this, didn't we? Like, remember, we had those feedback sessions about truth. We called them truth sessions, remember? Hard to handle for all of you. All of you felt a bit embarrassed. But our point wasn't to embarrass everyone. It was just to highlight issues of love that were not being addressed. And we think, as Mary said in the introduction last night, that if a person comes to our seminars, that that's what they want. <laughs> but that's not necessarily true, right? But this is what we'd like it to be, so that's what we do. So what do they do? Well... The majority, firstly, refuse to see the sin that's within them. Right? So that's the first thing we usually try to do. The next thing we try to do is we deny vigorously that we have sinned. If we can't deny it with the person who's telling us, 
we go around to everybody else and deny that what the person told us is actually not true. Right? Now, honestly, I've had this happen to us thousands of times, literally in the last 10 years. Every person who has gone down the road of sending us a breakup letter has always done this. You can predict it. I say to Mary, yeah, we're going to have to say something to that person because they're either in our life, they're not going to like it, this is where it's going to be in three months. Sure enough, that's where it is, three months' time. Usually sooner, usually sooner. We've predicted it with our families, Mary and I, both with our families. Oh, we're going to have to say something here or say something there, and sure enough, <laughs> next day, you can even predict the next day what's going to happen. Because there's denial of sin, you see. They claim that the person highlighting sin is the person with the sin. That's a good trick, eh? Right. Interestingly, if the person highlighting sin had the sin, wouldn't they struggle to see their own sin? Probably. But, you know, we don't think about those things. So it's not logical, obviously, but, but that's what we do. So somebody points out to us, we ask for truth, somebody points out the truth to us, then we go, no, that's not true. You're the one with the problem, <laughs> right? You're the one with the problem. And then when they don't accept that they're the one with the problem, what do we do? We go around and garner support for the fact that they're the problem. Now, how many of you have been approached by other people who are upset with me because of what I said to them? How many people? That's quite a lot. It's almost half of this audience. Right. Interesting. That's this. That's what we do, you see. When we sin and we don't like to face our sin, we want other people to agree with our sin. So what do we do? We run around and say, I'm not the problem. That person's the problem. Right? That's what we do. It's a way to dissemble from the sin, isn't it? A way to get away with seeing the sin. Yep. They and those who support them then attack, denigrate, and are condescending about the persons who highlighted the sin. So this is when we, Mary and I, generally start to get the nasty emails flying in. Because the nasty emails now not only come from the person who asked for the assistance in the first place, who now disagrees with us, but they now comes from all the people that they garnered support from. And how many times we receive information, like this person sends them, the way you treated such and such, that was really bad, blah, 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 blah. You know, uh, what happened in the years up leading up to why we did that particular thing? Uh, nobody wants to talk about that, of course. The garnering of support means that not only does the person, and in fact many people don't even send the breakup email, what they do is they get, their friend Joe Blow to send the Drake up email and, the, and Mary Smith and Mary Jones and Mary, you know, they just get everybody else to do their dirty work for them because they don't have the bravery or the courage to do it themselves. They don't even want to acknowledge that they're behind it, right? That's all not very cool, but it's all what we do in our sin, right? This is how the story of sin plays out. And those who support them continue their sin. And it's very sad because what we see is the person themselves continues the sin, the very sin that was highlighted to them in the first place. But not only that, they garner support for their sin. So now the people who are supporting them in their sin are sinning too. So now, now both are sinning, whereas before that wasn't happening. So, so the situation is actually worsening. And then they and those who support them go and teach other people that not only are they not sinning, but the very person who pointed out their sin is the sinner. Right? That's basically what they're saying. And so they're distorting God's moral truths even further. So now not only are they getting support, but they're actually teaching a falsehood. And there are serious consequences with God's laws for teaching falsehoods. Right? And they don't realise what's going on, that their condition now is severely degrading very rapidly because they desire to teach what is actually false. Right? The final result is the highlight of sin still defines their life, so they're still sinning there, but on top of that, the additional sins committed mean they are now 
degrading their condition, <laughs> which is going to cause them more pain. So where we tried to help them with their original problem, now, because of the choices and decisions being made, not only do they still have the original problem, but now they've got a whole series of other problems that they're going to have to fix and repent for at some point. What a disaster, right? It would be far better just go, I'm really upset, but I've got to control myself at least and look at the reason inside of myself why I want to just go and rage at everybody and get all this support and teach all the things that are now what I, you know, 10 minutes ago I thought what was being said to me was true. Now I believe everything that was said to me was false just because my moral condition was highlighted. <laughs> all right? So you can see the story of sin and how it interplays with our version of morality. So it's a very, very dangerous pr process to do. So I would recommend to you, if you're going to get upset with what anybody says to you, don't go around blasting them, right? Because all that does is make your situation worse. Instead, look at why you want to blast them. You see? What was the desire, the motivation to do so? A person who awakens to their sin doesn't go off the tree at people all the time without firstly feeling about their own condition. Right? Okay, so now we're looking at the very important requirements to awaken to our sin. Now, this is a very interesting area because Unless I see sin how God sees sin, I can't see sins. See sin how God sees sin, I can't see sin. <laughs> it's almost like, what are those things called where you do that? Yeah. So I can't stop sin unless I see the sin, if I unless I awaken. And I can't compensate for or be corrected for sin unless I see sin as God sees sin. And I can't ask for forgiveness if I don't see the sin. Right? And I can't receive God's love if I don't see the sin. And my awakening to sin is obviously an important part of doing all those things, isn't it? You can see that unless I awaken to sin and see sin as God sees sin, I am not going to have any awakening or any change in the way that I commit my sins. So that's an interesting thing. I've got to wake up. So sometimes I feel like grabbing people, you know, when they do the thing I just described earlier, I feel like grabbing them, wake up, you silly person. You know, you, you, look at where you're going. Turn around, look, 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 look. You know, if, if you could see the spiritual condition of what's going on around them and how dark and it becomes through the choice and decisions, you'd all want to go, wake up, wake up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a, it's a terrible result when we make choices and decisions that attract a whole lot of darkness around us. Mm, not good at all. So the first part of awakening to sin is being able to correctly identify who did the sin. <laughs> Were you surprised when you read this section of your outline? It's sort of like, who did the sin? Most of the time we go, who cares who did the sin? Right? But who did the sin is quite important to identify because the person who did the sin is the person who needs to correct the sin. If you don't know who did it, if you don't know when it's you and when it's somebody else, then you're going to try to correct things that you can't correct. And also you, you're going to ignore things that you need to correct because you blame others for them instead. So... The sin I received from my parents from the time of conception onward, who sins that? Mum and dad's. Quite obvious, right, that one? Okay. Injuries I received from others from the time of conception onwards that entered me before I had development, who's that? Well, that's not my sin. That's other sin, isn't it? Yeah. God's laws attribute that correctly. Okay. Now it starts getting a bit tricky because... Injuries which I willingly accepted from others because of my own codependence. Who sins that? Yeah, interesting, isn't it? That's my sin. So 
my willingness to go along with other people's sin is my sin. The sin which I generated by acting on the injuries. So I could have chosen not to act on the injuries, could I not? Yeah, so that's obviously my sin. My desire to avoid feeling about the injuries. Well, I'm suppressing my own emotions by deciding to not feel about it, so who sins that? Nobody else has got control over my emotions. My sin. All right? You can see my sins are starting to rack up, right? My desire to act in harmony with the injuries that other people perpetrated or want me to satisfy for them or myself. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, sometimes somebody else wants you to do something for yourself that is actually a sin. Like you often see this after a breakup, you know, when a person's had a breakup. Let's go out and get drunk and get laid, right? That's a statement you hear quite frequently, right? Huh? Maybe not in your circle. <laughs> but it, it certainly was a statement I heard very frequently when I was in my 20s. That's wanting me to satisfy myself by avoiding something, isn't it? Now, my desire to act in harmony with that, even though I'm being influenced, is my sin. My desire to deny, rationalise, defend or self righteously justify my sin. Well, that's quite obvious whose sin that is, is it? My sin. My desire to break God's laws in order to satisfy my own addictions. Well, that's pretty obvious whose sin that is, is it? My sin. My desire to remain ignorant about my sin is my sin. Isn't that interesting? I want to not know what or how I've sinned. Well, that's just another sin. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> You can't even get away with ignorance. When you really understand God's nature and personality, you think, it's so good that God did that. It is so good he did that. Yeah. My desire to actively disobey, be ignorant of, or not obey God's moral law. Right? That's my sin, obviously. My desire to treat people unequally. Even if I'm treating them as superior to me, is my sin. Why? Because from God's perspective, we're all equals. Right? So if I have a feeling of superiority or a feeling of inferiority, I am sinning. Interesting, isn't it? See, most people think when they've got a feeling of inferiority, that's cooler, right? That's better than a feeling of superiority. A lot of people think that. Of course, some people think completely the opposite of that. Superiority is better, but either way, I'm sinning. My desire to gain support for or involve others in my sin. It's a common thing, right? We need the approval of others in order to continue our sin frequently. Right? That's my sin too. So that's a, a very short list of what we made just to give you a bit of an idea of how to identify sin. Can you see, very little of it was mum and dad's problem. Very little of it was other people's problem. Most of it's our problem. So it's not like, uh, you know, it's all somebody else's problem, is it? It's really mostly our problem, mostly our personal problem. And that's what we've got to see with regard to sin. So... The qualities we're going to need to awaken to sin are, firstly, humility. It's pretty obvious, I think, why we need humility, isn't it? You're going to have to own up to things that you, know, you might feel uncomfortable owning up to, that you might feel it's hard to own up to. That's going to take humility. To be open to what God shares through the conscience, that's going to need humility. Desire to feel and experience emotion. To actually feel emotion requires humility. Not many people on this planet like anybody feeling emotion, trust me. Like We've been in many situations, Mary and I, we have been criticised for feeling emotion. Not only criticised, but also condescended to quite severely, right? Yeah, people don't like that very much. To be able to see myself as God sees me, it, it requires humility. Instead of holding on to your own perception of self, having God's perception of you. That requires humility. Because sometimes God's perception of you, while he loves you and cares about you, 
He's not that happy with what you sin, how you sin. To be able to accept truth from others, to be honest with myself, all requires humility. To see my anger is self-righteous, that requires humility. To be emotionally accept that my pain is the result of my choices, that's pretty hard, hey? Like most of us reach for a painkiller or something in that place instead of seeing it as my choice, right? Yeah. To emotionally accept that I'm equal, that requires humility, particularly for a person who's superior, but it also requires humility for a person who feels inferior. Can you see why? Because a person who feels inferior wants to hold on to their inferiority for different reasons. Usually it's because they don't want to stand out and they don't want to be themselves and things like that, right? But if you're humble, you would be yourself even if you're stilled out. You see? You would do that. So that that requires humility too. We need to develop the conscience. Why? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? We can't see God's viewpoint of what is right and wrong unless God tells us. And if the mechanism via which God tells us is the conscience, then not having the conscience developed is a problem. So we need to develop the conscience. That means having quiet times for yourself, contemplating your decisions and actions in your life and asking God about whether those decisions and actions are in harmony with his morality. Now, for most of us, we have a terribly busy life, right? Sometimes it's so busy we don't even get time to sit down for five minutes during a whole day. That's not good for us. Because we need to sit down and have these quiet times where we can contemplate with God what choices and decisions that we're making. We need to make that time as a priority. Yeah? You know, we need the conscience so that we can learn to love truth in all circumstances and to do it in all circumstances. It's tough, trust me. Like there's times in the world today where you go, well, it'd be really nice if I could just slip out of this one slip out of saying the truth in this situation because I know it's going to create a furor, you know, like a a fury coming at me. But a person who's humble and developed the conscience and wants that relationship with God will go, still got to do it. I'm still going to take that action. That's what moral fortitude is, isn't it? Taking an action in the face of opposition. Desire. Why do I need desire? Well, as we've said earlier, don't shut down desire. Desire is the key to your future life, right? You can't shut it down. You shut it down, it's going to be a disaster for you. So don't do that. Don't shut down desire. Seek the truth. Hold on to the truth. You need desire to seek and release your emotion as well. You need to have desires to do all of that. So you need desire desire to seek freedom from sin rather than freedom from pain that's hard sometimes you know sometimes i'm in a a lot of pain like like i said to mary sometimes i know the average person will go to hospital sometimes with the pain that i'm in right but i'm trying to seek freedom from sin rather than freedom from pain so i accept my pain and try to work out what it's all about right and i've had plenty of times where my pain's been pretty extreme My pain is the result of my previous career. I like the way we've said that. (laughs) Develop sincerity, authenticity. See myself as I truly am. Stop portraying myself as different to to what I really am. To be able to stand alone in the crowd. Most of us don't like that. God wants you to be an individual. Right, We need to learn how to be individuals, stand out. That's fine. We're not standing out for attention or approval. Just stand out by being you. Yeah, People get to know you. They'll enjoy you. It'll be great for your life and also great for them too. They get to experience you. Instead of getting to experience, as we said earlier, to sort of only what everybody wants you to be. Now, anybody can do that, you know. But you being you, God created you to be you. That's a very important part of your sincerity in your life. 
And to be able to honestly acknowledge when you're wrong, that's important too, obviously, isn't it? Yeah. And then what about love? The desire to love in all circumstances and situations, no matter how difficult the going is going to be. Now, why are we saying all these things? Well, these five things that we've listed are core things we need. They're going to be required of you to awaken to sin. No one in your life is going to really support you very well in awakening to sin because most of them are happy with your sins. Most of them are happy with the way. That's why they're attracted to you. They want you to sin in the way you sin. It's going to be hard to break out of that. You're going to go through periods where you almost have no friends because every single friend you ever had wants you to sin in a certain way and you stop sinning in that way and all of a sudden they don't like you anymore. Now, unless you do these things and have these personal qualities, you're not going to want to awaken to sin. You're going to say, no, I'm going to just go close down, shut down, ignore the whole issue and hope it goes away. Or many times I hear people say who hear divine truth say, I think I'll wait to the spirit world before I deal with that. Very silly thinking. Very silly thinking. People who have never been to the spirit world <laughs> don't understand how difficult it is to change in a circumstance that your sin has created. Yeah, it's very hard. So you definitely do not want to put off anything to them, honestly. The spirit world, particularly the hells of the spirit world, are full of people who have had that thinking. Put things off, put things off, put things off. Don't resolve things. Put things off, put things off. Die. Put things off, put things off, put things off. <laughs> and often they put things off for another hundred or two years. Why? All we're doing is delaying our own happiness. It's a silly thing to do. And if you could see the condition of some of these people in that place where they are denying their own happiness, it's terrible. Why would you want to do that? The average place we live here in Australia is probably like about midway through the first sphere of the spirit world, right, in terms of its condition. But the majority of people pass in a lower state than that. Not understanding that even some of the beautiful advantages we have in living in a place like we have here are not going to be available to you, you know. I can walk outside right now and look at the sun and see the sun and see the brightness and everything's nice and bright, right? Well, if I pass into the middle of the first sphere, what I see outside is just going to be like dusk all the time. It's like, I don't know if ever any of you have been to the North Pole or, you know, around the poles. It's like there in the wintertime, you know, you have that tiny little hour of space that it's sort of like, looks a bit like dusk or just before dawn, you know, and then you're back to dark again. And that's the space that a lot of people live in for a, for a while when they pass in the spirit world because they don't want to awaken to their sin. The person who awakens to their sin never passes to that kind of place. Never. You get at least to see some light, you know, and some daylight and some. you get to have some joys. But... Remember what I said just earlier. Awakening to sin is an emotional process. It has to be done emotionally. So hopefully you can see from that discussion the importance of firstly the process of awakening to sin and also how morality is tied into the awakening and also can see what it's going to require of you in terms of sin itself and seeing, correctly identifying the sin, the sinner, and the requirements that you need to develop so that you are able to work through sin eventually. So the reason why we had this discussion with you is because we would like to see everybody move away from this intellectual acknowledgement of sin itself into a true awakening to sin. And that's when people change. Many of you 
and we're not saying this to pull you down or anything, but many of you have not changed, right? You know you haven't changed. You're substantially the same person. You've felt, you've listened to divine truth and learnt a lot in that process and sometimes you've applied it, but internally many of you haven't changed. The reason why you haven't changed is because the emotional awakening of sin hasn't happened. Make sense? If you can emotionally awaken to the sin, your changes will be quite rapid actually. You will see these changes occurring. You'll feel them occurring. You'll feel like a different person. right? Sometimes it's going to surprise you how good things are right? without sin influencing your life. And sometimes you're going to have a real struggle on your hands because you want to kick back into that intellectual fight of your sin rather than actually dealing with it emotionally. But you've got to avoid that because awakening the sin, this process of awakening the sin, is all about doing it emotionally. Yeah. All right, well, we'll just have a break for 10 minutes. And uh, so it'll be 20 past, if we can come back at 20 past three. And we'll probably have about a 40-minute Q&A. Sound, sound all right? Okay. Thanks, guys.